Grab your Bible, if you would, and turn to Galatians chapter 1, please. I've got a lot of things that I would like to say, but I'm not going to choose tonight for it to be that time. I think we're all struggling with a lot of questions and a lot of feelings, so we're just going to keep the Patterson family and particularly Precious in our prayers and entrust God's will. Uh, to bring about what's best. We're studying Galatians chapter 1 tonight. We're continuing a uh, study of Galatians chapter 1. Actually, we introduced or we kind of talked about some introductory matters uh, last week in our class. We didn't get into the text of Galatians chapter 1, and Lord willing, we're going to get into the first five verses here in just a few moments, but to kind of bring ourselves back up to uh, the general context of the book of Galatians. Uh, you remember that Paul is writing a letter to the churches in the region of Galatia that have been assaulted by false teachers. And the primary doctrine that these false teachers are bringing and, and trying to enforce upon the churches in Galatia has to do with, with legalism. It has to do with binding law on, on people who have been released from law, okay? He's, he's combating the very thing that he himself was rescued from and is fighting so hard to maintain the freedom uh, of all of our brothers and sisters uh, in this letter, particularly those in the area of Galatia. Now, we were talking a lot last week about the concept of law, and I, I just want to say this again, and you'll probably hear me say it more than once or twice, but I think it's important. When you read in the New Testament, not just the book of Galatians or the book of Romans, but in many places in the New Testament, when you read the word law, especially in the context of salvation or of justification or of righteousness, there's a principle involved that goes far beyond just simply the law of Moses. Now, the law of Moses is a wonderful illustration of God's law. But God revealed law from, from, from the Garden of Eden, and there were many other laws that were involved, and God was in the continual process of revealing himself, and it was, it was finally manifested, at least in its most codified form, in what we know as the law of Moses that was delivered at Mount Sinai, okay? But I want you to understand that, that because we aren't particularly tested and tempted regarding the law of Moses and wanting to go back and practice some of the things that were required in the law of Moses, that sometimes we don't think that's, that the instruction about law applies to us. But the truth is, as we said last week, we're as tempted today as any people have ever been to try to be right with God on the terms of our performance or law. In other words, and I'll just use a couple of things generically, not picking on anything, but just as an illustration, sometimes we get the idea that while attending the worship services and the assemblies of the church is obviously important because it, it's an expression of our family relationship, of our fellowship. It's an opportunity for us to corporately worship God. A lot of things that are important about the assembly. But sometimes people begin getting in their, eye, in their mind that if I attend the worship services of the church this many times or this often, however often that may be for you, whatever rule you decide to abide by, that that somehow gives me uh, uh, the love of God or the approval of God or that I've gained a special relationship with God because of it. We need to understand, and this is really kind of in a very very broad statement. The point of the, of the book of Galatians as well as the book of Romans that we need to understand once and for all that our relationship with God, our being saved, our being justified isn't dependent upon us achieving or earning or working for anything. That doesn't mean that we aren't hard workers. It doesn't mean that we aren't committed to doing God's will. It means that we're trying to do God's will not in order to be right with God, but because we've been made right with God, okay? That, does that make sense? I mean, I, I don't want to just keep repeating something that doesn't 
doesn't make any sense. We haven't historically, we haven't historically thought in those terms. I mean, we've, we've, and I say we, I'm a preacher, so I can be hard on preachers. We've taught and we've preached that if you do these things like attending services and giving of your uh, blessings from God financially, and if you do this and you do that and you do the other, then, then, then you're in a good standing with God. You're faithful, as we say. Well, the truth is, it's possible for you to do all those things and still not be right with God, isn't it? There's much more involved, and that's what the book of Galatians is about. It's the danger that the churches in Galatia were being tempted with to go back to a system that they'd been rescued from. And I want to just remind you that of all the writings in the New Testament, I can't think of anywhere that Paul speaks in more, I don't want to say harsh, but plain spoken terms than he does in the book of Galatians. I mean, he talks about, for example, uh, one of the things the Judaizing teachers were trying to enforce on the Christians in Galatia was that you need to be circumcised, and then you can really be a Christian, okay? They weren't discounting Christ. They just said you need something along with him, along with that. And Paul says about that, that if you allow yourself to be circumcised, then Christ is of no value to you. Now, I want you to think about that, and we said that last week. That's quite a statement. He's not talking about the physical transaction of, of, of circumcision. He's talking about the legal demand of circumcision. He said if you, if you have to perform and measure up and achieve and be bound by, then you don't need Christ because Christ came to free you from those things, to do for you what you could never do for yourself. He uses terminology that we have heard, I have heard, many times in many different contexts. It talks about someone falling from grace as some great tragedy, and it is a horrible thing. It's a frightening thought. But I want you to understand that it's only spoken in the New Testament in the context of someone going back to legalism rather than accepting justification by faith based on God's grace. Okay, Book of Galatians is going to force us to answer some questions about how can a man be right with God? What, what role does law play in God's plan? Because there's no question that God had given law, and if he knew that it wasn't going to provide justification, then why did he give law? If it couldn't make a man right with God, then what was the point? We're going to have to come to grips with that question. Is the law sinful? Is it bad? Is it flawed? We're going to have to answer that question, and of course Paul will for us. Uh, what's the nature of the gospel? We use that word rather generally sometimes. What's the nature, the true definition of the gospel, the good news? Because Paul says in Galatians 1, the churches there were being tempted to accept another gospel that really wasn't good news at all. It really wasn't another gospel. It really wasn't only gave that appearance. What role does the Holy Spirit play in the life of a believer? We're going to have to talk about that. Uh, what are the results of or the effects of the indwelling of God's Spirit within us? What does that produce? What does that look like? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that and probably more clearly in the book of Galatians than anywhere else in the New Testament. Are Christians still under the laws regarding diet and holy days and Sabbaths and those kind of things? We're going to have to talk about that. Uh, can a believer forfeit, lose, give up his salvation? We're going to talk about that. So there's a lot of important topics, subjects that we're going to deal with as we study the book of Galatians. And I mean, they're fundamentally important, not so that you can win an argument, but so you can understand how good the gospel really is. How, what, what good news it truly is. Now, I asked you a question as we were stopping last week, for those of you that were here last week, and that was by far the majority of you. I asked you to think about, to study about, and be prepared to answer and discuss the answer to a question that we understand, obviously, that the Jews were given the law of Moses. 
We understand that. We, we talk about law and we talk about Jews' connectedness all the time. My question is, if the Jews had the law of Moses, did the Gentiles have a law? And if they did, what was it? I mean, did the Gentiles, those other than the descendants of Abraham, fleshly descendants of Abraham, did they have a law given to them by God? It wasn't the law of Moses, was it? Somebody nod or disagree with me one here. Was it the law of Mo was the law of Moses for the Gentiles and the Jews? No, it was for the Jews. So if the law of Moses was for the Jews, did the Gentiles have a law? I know some of you know the answer to that. Well, I'm going to answer that, and then you have to answer the next one. Yes, the Gentiles did have a law from God. Okay? Yes, they did. And yes, they do. They always have had. What law did they have? What law did God give the Gentiles? If I ask you what, God, what, what law God gave the Jews, you could answer that. What law did God give the Gentiles? Roderick, flip back to, to Romans chapter 2, please, sir. You, you and I talked about this passage last week. Read a couple of verses there that answers that question, if you would. Romans chapter 2. That will uh, that'll work. Now, I break, obviously, I ask him to read a text that breaks right into the middle of a big discussion in the first three chapters of Romans, okay? You don't want, you don't want me to get started talking about the first three chapters of Romans, so we picked that part out on purpose, and I picked that part out to make this observation. Paul is proving the universal condition of men, universal condition of men under law. That, that under law, we're all, in fact, he's going to come to chapter 3, verse 20, and he's going to conclude that no one can be declared righteous in God's sight by works of law. No one. Now, we know about the Jews and their law. The question was, do the Gentiles have law? And the answer is yes. They have law. And the law is described to us in Romans chapter 2 as a law that was written on their hearts. A law that was written on their hearts. Who wrote that law on their hearts? If you've read the earlier part of chapter 2, you know the answer is God put it there. God put it there. What? Well, that's not a fair question to ask. Let me ask it this way. When God delivered to Moses at Mount Sinai the tables of the tablets of stone, on which were written what we call the Ten Commandments. Was the information that God gave Moses and wrote on those tables of stone new information? Was that new information? Was that information that men had never known before? Now, several of you have already said no, and you're right. How do you know that? How do you know that the Ten Commandments, at least nine of them, at least nine of them, weren't new information? How do you know that? Let me pick one. How do you know that men already knew it was wrong to kill? Thou shalt not kill. 
shall not murder. How do you know before the law of Moses, men already knew that? When, when, when the first two children born on the planet were involved in a physical altercation that resulted in one brother killing the other, and God asked, what have you done, or where, where is your brother? How did, how did Abel respond to that question? Did he say, well, I didn't know there was anything wrong with killing him. Did he say that? Did he act like that? No, he, he was evasive, defensive, and he knew he was guilty. And that was before Moses ever brought the Ten Commandments, okay? Now, I only make that point to say this law written on the heart included a lot of things. Now, I don't know. I can't define for you all that it included, okay? But it included at least nine of the Ten Commandments. And I say nine because one of them was only for the Jews, and that was the Sabbath law, right? Only for the Jews. At least the other nine were part of a law that God put on men's hearts and in men's minds. Now, here's the better question. When did that happen? When did that happen? When was it that a law was written on men's hearts? I mean, well, let's, let's start at the very beginning. When God created Adam and Eve, he gave them a verbal law that said, you can eat of anything you want in the garden except the fruit of that one tree in the middle of the garden. And in the day that you eat of it, you'll die. So it wasn't, that law wasn't written on their heart initially in the very beginning. When was that law written on their heart? Our heart. On all men's hearts. What was the name of that tree? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, a lot of things changed that day, didn't they? A lot of things changed that day. I mean, we talk about physical death and we talk about spiritual death, and those are the big ticket items. Those are big issues. But you know what? It was, it was in fact, true that we became aware of good and evil, right and wrong. Now, let me be quick to explain or let me be quick to say that doesn't mean that even though God gave Adam an Eve law, that it was as much law as he gave them after they partook of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it doesn't mean that those people on whose hearts that law was written had as much law as those who were at Mount Sinai and Abraham's descendants and received the law uh, that we know the law of Moses. I didn't say they all had the same amount of law. What I said is they all have God-given law. God revealed himself to everyone. And the reason that's going to be so important is because just because you're not a Jew in Paul's time and that the, the teaching about the law of Moses is, is vital and important because that's the immediate topic doesn't mean that Gentiles didn't struggle with the law they had just as much as the Jews did the one they had. Okay? Because the truth is, the Jews not only had the law that was written on their heart, they had the law of Moses on top of that, in addition to that. And the problem is, if we can't keep one law, which is where it all started, and be right with God, how in the world does it help for us to get more law? And more law. And more law. It doesn't, in the context of being right with God. In the context of salvation, if one law can't justify us, if we can't be justified under one law, then we can't be under ten or a hundred or a thousand. Which again brings us back full circle to the question, then why did God give law? Why did God give law? You think God was surprised that Adam and Eve couldn't keep the law that he gave them? Do you think he was surprised by that? No, he knew that. And the reason I know he knew that is because he said he already... He already ordained Christ to die on a cross before the world was ever created. He knew. If he knew we weren't going to be able to be justified by law, then why did he give it? What was the point? What was the purpose? 
Now, I'm not talking about, I told you last week, I'm not talking about the political reasons or the social reasons because there were some. God giving the law of Moses to the Jews enabled them to become a great nation, okay? There were, there were some, a lot of other reasons, a lot of other effects of the law, but I'm talking about in the context of salvation, being right with God. If God knew we couldn't be right with him by obeying law, why did he give it? To prove to us that you can't do it on your own and you need me. You have to have me. It was, as Paul says in the very book that we're studying, a schoolmaster or a tutor to lead us to Christ. Right? That was the point. Now, it did a lot of other things. I mean, you read the law of God and it tells you a lot about God's nature, his character, the kind of God he is. But I said in the context of salvation, the reason God gave law was so that we could realize how inept we are how desperately we need him, how we're hopeless without him, okay? Any question, comment? We've got to get to the first five verses of Galatians chapter 1. Anything? It's hopeless. It's hopeless. It's like I've used the illustration of a man that if you if you went to and walked up under the edge of a swimming pool and you saw someone underwater and then their head popped above water and you just raced over there and you threw in this life preserver and you jumped to their rescue, how would they feel about that if the reason their head was underwater, they were just diving to the bottom to see how long they could hold their breath? They don't want to be rescued. But you know what? If they're drowning, and they know they're drowning, and they know they don't have any fight left, guess what they're ready for now? I need to be rescued. I need to be rescued. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll be rescued before anything else. I'll give up everything just to be rescued. Same thing with the gospel. You see people that don't want the gospel, that are too busy for the gospel, that are disinterested in the gospel, they think they've got it under control. They think they're good enough. Think they're good enough. Now, I'm not judging. I'm just saying that's the truth. That's the fact. Because nobody wants to be separated in eternity from God. It's just that we don't sometimes realize how bad we need God. Which is why Romans begins with three chapters that talk about condemnation before he ever starts talking about salvation. Let's read, let's read together in, in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Let's read the first five verses together, and we'll have to cover this pretty quick. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm trying to figure out how to ask this. Is there anything about those first five verses that you are puzzled why Paul would have to tell people who are already Christians some of these things. I mean, why does Paul have to tell 
Christians, the church. That's who he's talking to, that's who he's writing to. Why does he have to tell them that I've been sent not from men, not by men, but by Jesus? And God the Father who raised him from the dead, along with all of the brethren, and then come to verse 3 and say, or verse 4 and say, talking about Jesus again, the Jesus who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. Doesn't the church know that? Doesn't the church know all that stuff already? They had to have. If they didn't know Jesus came to rescue them and forgive their sins, they couldn't be Christians. My question is, why is Paul having to write that? I mean, right here in the introduction, you might say to the book, what do we already see? What do we already know? We may not know what Paul's going to talk about yet, but we know he's having to tell people who are Christians things that Christians ought to have long ago learned and ought to not need anybody to tell them about anymore. Mike? That's right. That's right. You know, a lot of people have looked at the book of Galatians and have thought, well, let me say it this way, have failed to understand something that I think is really important. And that is that when Paul defends himself, and he does this to the church at Corinth too, when Paul defends himself as an apostle and his motives as an apostle. The reason he's doing that is not so that he impresses somebody, not so that everybody's gonna think he's someone great. He's doing that because if you can't discount the doctrine, then you attack the messenger that teaches the doctrine and create doubt and questions. And that's what's happening, okay? They're questioning these Judaizing teachers whether Paul's really one of the apostles or not. And that's a good question, by the way. I mean, I can, I can see from a human viewpoint why that would be a good question, because he wasn't one of the original 12, was he? He wasn't one of the original 12. So, so it would make sense. I mean, it's not right, but it would make sense from a human argument's point. That if you can cause people to think that, well, he's not really an apostle. And anything he's been told or anything that he's received or any gospel he's preaching, he had to be taught it from some other man. And, and secondhand information isn't always reliable, right? The only reason Paul defends himself here or anywhere else in the New Testament is because he won't stand for the gospel being ignored, disrespected, or disregarded. He doesn't want himself to become an obstacle to people believing the truth of the gospel. Now, I mean, you know, that's kind of a mixed bag. And I've thought about that a lot uh, as a preacher or as a teacher and as a Christian. We ought to be very concerned about our lives lining up with what we teach. But, you know, in the, in the truth of things, in, in the real truth of things, Anybody that speaks the truth is speaking the truth, right? I mean, even if a guy has been drunk all of his life and he speaks the truth, it's still the truth, isn't it? It's just not packaged very well. It's just not, it's just not appealing, maybe we would say. And Paul doesn't want his credibility or his apostleship or the doubts concerning those things to be an obstacle to people believing the gospel. That, that's the whole point. That's the whole point. That's why he's going to talk about them as dear children for whom he says, I'm agonizing in childbirth again until Christ is formed in you. That's a pretty graphic picture, isn't it? Just like, just like a, a mother going through childbirth and all the anxiety and concerns and all those things to see a, a healthy child born. That's exactly what Paul says I'm going through for the churches in Galatia. Uh, it's immediately evident to us, or it should be, if we read deliberately, 
that Paul has something really serious on his mind, else he wouldn't be telling the church some of the things that the church ought to have known and remembered long ago. Long ago. But the fact that he's having to say it again means what? False teachers are gaining a foothold in Galatia. False teachers are gaining a foothold in Galatia. And he won't stand for it. He won't, I mean, let me, let me say it this way. You know that Paul didn't write this letter, right? The Holy Spirit wrote this letter. He used Paul, okay? This is God's, God's letter to the church in Galatia. He just used Paul to communicate it. Uh, let's talk about three things real quick. And if you're in your outline, it begins on page six and goes through the end of the first lesson. Uh, and I'm not going to have time to do what I want to do. But let's first talk in the first two verses about Paul's ministry. The first thing he says is, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see further into the book why he has to say that. Because as, I, as, as Mike mentioned and as I've uh, reminded you, one of the questions is going to be whether Paul's really an apostle. Because that's an accusation made against him, that he's not. He's just a, a Johnny-come-lately and he's only been taught what he's teaching by somebody else. Okay? But he, he clarifies immediately that I'm an apostle and I was sent not from men or by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. In other words, there's authority in back of Paul being where he is and saying what he's saying. Right? Not representing myself or any other man. I'm here on God's behalf. I am who I am because of what God's done for me, through me, and in me. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about the message that he's preaching here and clarifying it immediately. The gospel that he's going to talk about is about Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sin to rescue us from this present evil age according to according to the will of God our Father. In other words, this has been the plan all along. This has been that men need to be saved, they need to be redeemed, and that's in a nutshell the message of the gospel. He doesn't detail all of it, but that's in a, in a concise statement, the gospel. And that's, he said, that's what I came to preach. That's the message I come to represent. And then finally he says in verse uh, 5, concerning God the Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. One of the things that's going to be so striking about Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia is that he's so straightforward in telling the Galatians why these people are trying to trick you into believing what they want you to believe. And it's not for God's glory. Okay? That's the point. He said, the reason they're trying to get you to be circumcised is so that they can go back and brag to their friends that we've done some great thing. They're not doing it, they're not doing it because they're honoring God or glorifying God. That's why he comes here and says, that's my whole motive. That's my whole purpose, is to glorify and honor God. Now, <clears throat> let let me talk about one other thing before, and we, we kind of introduced it last time, but let me talk about one more thing before I'm comfortable leaving this section. And it's not necessarily a direct textual study from the first five verses, but it certainly relates. I think it's important that we understand from the very beginning. Why is it that Paul is so concerned? I mean, we're talking about these Judaizing teachers have come to Galatia and they're telling the brethren you need to be circumcised and you need, to, you need to change your diet and stop eating some of the things that you're accustomed to eating and start. What's the big deal? Why is Paul so passionate about them keeping a few rules? Because those rules try to take the gospel and mix it with something else. And in essence, it says Jesus is good, but he's not enough. Yeah. 
right? I mean, that's, that's the essence of the message. He's good. He's good. But in order to really be a Christian, you're going to have to do some other things. You're going to have to add to that a little bit, right? And Paul says, oh, no, no, no. You do that, and you've fallen from grace. You do that, and, and, and Christ is of no value to you. He's passionate about it, and he's, he's deliberate about it because he knows their salvation depends on it. Now, there are a lot of things you can get wrong and still go to heaven. Does that surprise you? I hope it doesn't because every one of us have got things wrong. <laughs> okay? I, I don't mean everything. I mean there are some things that you can get wrong in ignorance and still go to heaven. Jesus Christ and justification by faith through God's grace isn't one of those things. It isn't one of those things. You've got to get that right because that's the only way to heaven. That's exactly what Jesus said. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Even Jesus taught that, see? And everybody afterward taught the same thing. That's why this is so important. That's why Paul is so worked up about what's going on here. It's not just that they're disrespecting Paul, as some people have said. Really, I don't think Paul cared one way or the other whether he was disrespected by them. I don't think their evaluation of him meant too much to him one way or the other. What did matter to him was whether they allowed that to cause them to doubt the gospel. And that's unacceptable. That's unacceptable, okay? That's right. Like Peter and John and Andrew and all the rest of them. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's much authority. That's right. That's right. No, there was... It's just a matter of, Charles, it's a matter of, and let's just be totally honest with ourselves and say that we, if somebody speaks flattering, smooth, well-spoken words, okay, and they impress us with their presence, and they have all the credentials, their resume looks impeccable, and -and so-and-so recommends them, can't we be sometimes influenced into believing things or thinking things easily as well. That's exactly what's happening. These false teachers represented themselves as being sent from Jerusalem by the apostles. I mean the apostles, not Paul, who's not really one, the apostles, right, they would say. Yes. Well, that's, I, I would say in response to that the same thing. I do a lot, a lot of other things. If we understood the sense in which the word apostle is used, there are times when the word apostle is used generally. Does that make sense? Okay, generally. To talk about anyone who's been commissioned by God. But by far the majority of the time, and what Paul's trying to prove, has nothing to do with the general sending of messengers. It has to do with the specific commissioning by the authority of God and divinely revealed. Okay? And anybody, let me me just say it this way. I would think it would be a fearful thing to make such a claim knowing that it isn't true. I, I would have to, uh, that, that would frighten me a little bit. A whole lot, actually. A whole lot, actually. Uh, 
the question that's really fundamental, and I'll start with this. The question that's really basic to the book of Galatians is, how can a man be right with God? How can a man be right with God? And I'm going to tell you, this isn't the first time that question has come up. Not the first time this question's come up. It's been the question on people's mind since the Garden of Eden. It's always been. And I think about, let me give you an illustration of Job and his three friends. If you've read the book of Job lately, but Job found himself in a really difficult situation because God allowed him, knowing his strength, to be tested by adversity and a lot of the loss of a lot of things. Job was sitting in, a, in what, humanly speaking, was a very despicable position. I mean, you talk about hard times. He had hard times. He had about as much hard times as anybody you know ever had. And along come his three friends. Along come his three friends. And they start giving him advice. They start sharing their perspective. And their perspective is, Job, the bottom line is, if you hadn't done something wrong, this wouldn't have happened to you. You hadn't done enough to keep God happy. You hadn't done enough to keep God happy. And you've done something to make God unhappy or else you wouldn't be suffering the way you're suffering. Now, I'm not going to go into Job's story, but I'm going to tell you, if you think that died with Job and his three friends, you're wrong. The majority of humans alive on the planet today still subscribe to that same philosophy. I don't just mean in, in terms of suffering because of sin. I mean what their philosophy was, Job, if you really want to get better, then you're just going to have to try harder. You're just going to have to try harder. And what Job kept trying to tell them was, now, I'm pretty sure that's not the answer. Now, he didn't say it that way. I'm just being kind of sarcastic. But that, that's what he was trying to say. Uh, the doctrine or the idea, the philosophy, that a man can be right with God by trying harder, by working more, by achieving it by his performance is exactly the same problem that Paul is, is, is correcting in the churches in Galatia. That's, that's what it is. Because the Jews were telling, the Judaizing teachers were telling these Christians, you can be right with God if you'll be circumcised. If you'll change your diet. If you'll do whatever else. And the truth is, they could have done all those things and made no difference in their spiritual condition whatsoever. In fact, Paul said what it will do is it'll cause you to lose the secure position you've been given in Christ. You'll give up God's grace and lose it, and lose it. Uh, salvation and a man being right with God. Well, I'm going to stop. I've got one more thing I want to say, but I'm not going to keep you over time this early in the game. <laughs> I may, after five or six weeks, keep you a little longer. Who knows, but not the second night. I, I want to I ask you or challenge you or encourage you, maybe is the better way, to... We're going to begin next week, and obviously in the text, we're going to begin in verse 6, and we'll go down through verse 9 or so, probably. At least that's my plan. But I want you to think about our study about between now and then, this concept of a man, how can a man be right with God? And, and knowing that he can't be right with God by trying harder, we've already established that. Is it any better to say, since we know that we are saved by faith, right? We do know that. Paul teaches that pretty clearly, pretty plainly, the, the, not only Paul. We're saved. The condition of us receiving God's grace is our faith, right? Now, <clears throat> don't get mad at me because I want you to study it and I want to talk about it next week. And I've got to leave you hanging for a week to make you study it, Okay? I think it has been with the best of intentions that people have said, and I've said it myself at previous times in my life, that in order to be saved, in order for a man to be right with God, he has to have faith plus obedience. I've said that, and you've heard people say that. I know what we're trying to say. <clears throat> 
And I'm not criticizing what we're trying to say. But I'm telling you we're teaching false doctrine in saying it because it's not true. There is faith plus nothing. Okay? I got everybody all shook up now, don't I? All shook up now. Let me tell you the solution to that anxiety that you're feeling in your heart. You study what the Bible says faith is. And you won't have to say faith plus anything. You hear me? That's what we're going to do next time as we start off. So just relax. I know you've gotten kind of anxious when I said that, but I do that. I'm going to do that on purpose because I, I want you to open your book. I want you to open your book. I know what we intend, so relax. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm just saying we, we are we're teaching something that isn't true. We're perpetuating a misunderstanding when we say faith plus anything saves us or makes us right with God. And the reason I can make that statement is because the Bible tells us what faith is. And once we understand what faith is, we won't have to plus it with anything. Okay? If you got any questions about that, ask Sergio. <laughs> I'm picking. I won't do that to you. I'm in the office. You come talk to me anytime. We're going to stop for tonight. I appreciate everybody's attention. You have a question or a comment before we stop? Anything at all? I promise we'll get a little more focused, but I want to get your mind. I, I want to get some big concepts in our head that will make us really appreciate the book of Galatians. Okay? All right. And we'll get there. We'll get there. I promise. Lord willing.